Awesome. All right. So um, it's our distinct honor to introduce our special guest here today. You know him from Mystery Science Theater, TV's Frank, Cinematic Titanic, and of course, now the Mads are back. Um, we're here to talk about the upcoming riff by the Mads of the infamous Manos, the Hands of Fate on December 14th. Welcome, Frank Conniff. Thank you. For, okay. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, we're glad to have you. So um, I was wondering, um, you know, Manos is one of the movies that MST3K made famous or, you know, infamous, maybe. <laughs> um, I know you were the guy who picked out a lot of the movies, the show, including this one. What was the story, how you found this thing? Um, well, it's, you know, it's not that particularly, you know, it's not like a national treasure kind of story or anything like that. <laughs> uh, it was just... Um, as my job um, uh, at Best Brains was, I screened the films and then chose them to show to the rest of the writers to decide if we were going to uh, riff them or not. So Manos was just another film that I, I saw on, on a VHS tape in a box of tapes I got from uh, HBO Downtown Productions, which was the company that did all the comedy channel programming and comedy central uh, programming. And um, so, uh, you know, it was just a tape that I saw and I saw it and I was like, wow, you know, I just, I've got to show everyone else <laughs> I'm looking at. And uh, I remember we were, we, we watched it uh, while we were having lunch, which was maybe not a great idea. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, um, you know, but everybody immediately agreed that, you know, we, we had, to, this was one we had to, rip, you know, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. I, I know, I'm sure you've been preparing for the, for the new riff. When's the last time you've seen it? Uh, I haven't seen it. I don't think, uh, in its entirety since we riffed it, you know, like 30 years ago, wow. or however long ago that was, I have seen. Uh, scenes from it and a, a, um, a clip from it. I, I did an improvised riff of at this club here in New York in Queens called QED, which uh, Chris Kirschbeck produced a show there called Movies Are Dumb, which were live improvised riffs. And I participated nice. in sometimes. And um, so we did just a clip of it there. But I think that's the only time I've really seen it, except for all the gifts that I see. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of them out there. You search yeah, for yeah. Manos on Giphy, it just explodes. Yeah. yeah. Like, you guys really made this famous. <laughs> yeah. Which I wonder um, to an extent, was that like, if it since it became so famous because of you guys, did the people who made it, is this that kind of the reason they were able to do their Kickstarter and get the, the prequel and the sequel made? Yeah, I think they've all said that, you know, that we were the ones that... Um, uh that made it um famous it was um uh i think it was only released in texas like you know privately by the guy who made it mm -hmm. um and they had a premiere and everything i don't think it got wide distribution and then it was just really underground for a long time and uh um you know mystery science theater uh, is you know that's that's one film we can say, you know, we made it, uh, we're the ones that made it famous. You know, we can't, we can't say that about any Ed Wood films or anything like that. Cause, cause a lot of those were notorious before, before we came along. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, Manos is the one that, that, um, people, um, have probably heard of because of us. So yeah. it's a, a dubious distinction at best. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I mean, I, who hasn't, who hasn't seen the Torgo walk? I mean, come on. No, he tried he, the Torgo, Torgo walk. is iconic. What can I say? Yeah. He is. He is. How did the idea of um, doing the new riff come up? Um, well, we were just, you know, um, we for our December riff, you know, this is only our second um, year that Tracy, well, you and I have been doing these um, digital online shows and Last year, we took an old, um, for the December show, we, you know, we, we figured we should maybe do some kind of Christmas thing. And um, last year, we did Santa Claus, which we had also riffed, um, mm -hmm. Spanish uh, Santa Claus movie, which we had riffed on Mystery Science Theater. We did a whole new riff of it for December, uh, kind of a special Christmas thing. And then 
Um, you know, this year we were thinking, you know, all the Christmas stuff has been done already. Rift Tracks does a lot of, has done all kinds of Christmas movies and stuff. And, and then we just decided that um, Manos the Hands of Fate would be like a special Christmas treat to do that, you know. For sure. Um, so, so that's why, you know, it's, it's oddly enough our Christmas movie this year. <laughs> hey, I, I'm all in favor of Torgo Claus. I think that would be pretty oh fantastic. <laughs> now I'm going to have to try to draw that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I know you mentioned uh, other Christmas movies. I know Santa Claus Conquers the Martians was one of the movies that has been riffed three times by MST3K and Rift Tracks. And um, I know, I think this is going to be the second movie that's been riffed three times. Um, uh, yeah, I probably, if, if, if it's like the trifecta of, uh, mm -hmm. of MST and then Rift Tracks and then Trace and I, um, Santa Claus Conquers the Martian was done three times because um, we, because Rift Tracks did it and then Cinematic Titanic mm -hmm. did it as well. Yep. So Trace and, Trace and I, I think Trace refuses to do that one again. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, yeah, so I, I think, you know, it's in that category of, of films that have been riffed a few times. And, and I'm sure a lot of people just at home have riffed it, you know. So. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I say like, like Santa Claus Conquers the Martians is one that puts my dad into tears every single yeah. time. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I saw it when I was a kid, when it was in first release, when I was like eight years old or something like that. Was that, was that traumatic? <laughs> no, you know, but it, the thing about it is, I mean, when I was that kid, I, 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 when I was that age, I think I was, I just liked anything. If it was on TV, if it was on a movie screen, I watched it and, and that was enough for me. But I don't think I thought Santa Claus Conquers the Martians was very good because um, because I had no I, I only remembered that I saw it, but I didn't remember anything from the movie, whereas around that time, you know, was the same time when I was a kid when I saw Mary Poppins, you know, and I remembered mm -hmm. everything in Mary Poppins mm -hmm. for the rest of my life, you know, so I think when you forget a film, it, it means it didn't really have that much of an impact on you. Yeah, definitely. for sure. What do you think made Mando stand out from all of these other movies that you've had been able to riff? What do you um, think that really made it? Uh, I think that it's there's something just singular about its vibe, and um, uh, it's it has that unique me quali quality. It's not exactly like an Ed Wood movie, but it, it it has the same kind of Ed Wood thing, which to me is. You know, Ed Wood kind of, you, kind of, you see a part of his soul in his, in his, in his movie making. It's just so unique, and I think this movie had that same quality where, um, it just um, had a tonality. Uh, it's not the worst film we ever did. I think, I think there are worse films we did. I think The Creeping Terror was worse. I think The Dead Talk Back was worse, um, but. Um, you know, it just has its own, it just, like Ed Wood, it feels like it was made by an individual. As bad as it is, it's like, a, it's like personal filmmaking in a weird way. And, um, and I think that's part of why I feel like Manos and films like it stand out. Yeah, yeah I think it's part of its charm. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. We, were, we were talking about that, that we felt like a lot of these movies that are these real low budget, bad movies, like you said, like the Ed Wood movies, even like Birdemic and stuff like that. It's like, you can tell that the people who made it really cared and tried, but when yeah. you see movies that have these massive budgets, like we actually, a couple of one of our first episodes, we reviewed Malignant and I was like, this movie had a huge budget and just someone should have told James Wan no. <laughs> and so we were just like, I always feel like when I watch this, I'm like more annoyed because I'm like, you had all the stuff to be able to make this awesome and you just, didn't even put it he just like made something to make money it felt like whereas all these yeah. other ones are like i think i read somewhere manos was made on a bet like that it was like one guy bet him bet the director he couldn't do it or something like that and so they did it based on a bet <laughs> yeah i i believe that you know and um you know i've i've said for a long time and i mean this sincerely i'm not being glib that i i like ed wood as a director more than i like michael bay you know uh, ed wood's movies have a real personal kind of soulful quality to them. And, you know, people like Michael Bay, their, mo their movies are so impersonal and, mm -hmm. 
um, and they, they, I don't get anything out of them. Whereas I do get something out of, out of an Ed Wood movie or a movie like Manos the Handsome. Yep. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. A, a movie like that will stick with me forever. Whereas a movie yeah. like a blow em up action movie is just out of my brain as soon as it's over. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, even the Star Wars holiday special sticks with me forever, but probably for slightly different <laughs> that reasons. Is, but I, I, that one is the painful one. I don't know if I could ever watch. I, I've one. never, he, apparently Dan's watched it without the, the riff tracks over it, but that was our first pretty much date ever is Dan was like, brought that over to my house and was like, here, let's watch this. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, uh, the, 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 um, the Star Wars holiday special, uh, to me, the fa it's not to me. It's not that it's a bad Star Wars thing, although it is. But what it really is to me, it's a, it's it's a it's a bad '70s variety show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the sensibility behind it. Uh, um, it. It was made by all like um, variety show people um, um, who normally worked on you know stuff like the Donnie and Marie show and mm -hmm. stuff like that, that was big in the seventies. And actually the seventies is what killed off the variety show genre, which was huge in television in the fifties and the sixties. Mm -hmm. um, and in the seventies, um, there was just a dearth of, uh, of, of really bad um, variety shows. I know some people like the Sonny and Cher show. I, I wasn't a fan of it. Um, the um, the Captain and Tennille show, you know, and uh, stuff like that. And that's what the Star Wars holiday special is really in that genre way more than it's in the Star Wars genre, mm -hmm. you know, for um, sure. And I also feel that Lucas, from what I hear, he just wanted to sell toys that Christmas. So he, he, mm -hmm. he wanted some kind of Star Wars product out mm -hmm. and he didn't even uh, pay attention to it that much and um you know um it, it says to me that that lucas really didn't even though star wars was so huge even back then i don't think he knew what he had really yeah like, for sure you know. so it's yeah. fascinating in that sense yeah yeah it, it's quite the historical piece for sure <laughs> and i know he he's been quoted as saying that if if he could he could find every bootleg of it and smash it to pieces yeah <laughs> But it's a part of his legacy and you know it's 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 it has a life of its own and he should just embrace it yeah for sure for sure disney has i mean they <laughs> they decided to make a lego star wars yeah, holiday yeah, special I that, but i heard it was very good and it's uh, cute yeah. yeah and um yeah it's it, it whether he like you know mark hamill tweets about it all the time mm -hmm. on um so uh it's definitely it's definitely there yeah so back to Manos, out of curiosity, have you seen either the prequel or the sequel that they made? Uh, no, I haven't. Have you seen it? We watched them mm -hmm. both yesterday. I oh, got really? through them. <laughs> They're very well, interesting. I, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, the people who made them, you know, I, I say God bless and oh, for sure. I wish them well, but, uh, but I don't know, like, why I need to see that, you know, I, I don't know <laughs> I need to see a Manos sequel. And, you know, that kind of that vibe that I was talking about of the film, um, it can't be recreated. You can't be self-conscious and make a movie like Manos, The Hands of Fate. The, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, stuff, there's some stuff now like uh, like Sharknado or something like that that's, that's very self-conscious and very aware of that it's so bad. It's, it's trying to be so bad it's good, but it's mm -hmm. trying to do that. And that ruins it for me, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm. I. It's just um, like I said. The people who made it, I wish them well. But I, I. I'm not. That's not a particular kind of thing that I'm into. Yeah, the the funny thing, bring up Sharknado is in the in the sequel at the very beginning. There's these kids in the car and they're talking about Sharknado and how bad it is and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's like they're they're really really aware of it, even referencing that. So. Yeah, yeah, it's just, um, I mean, it's, and people enjoy it, and that's fine, but it's, to me, like, people associate Sharknado with Mystery Science Theater, it's that kind of thing, and to me, it's a whole different thing from what we did, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, you know, it's not something that really interests me that much. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of the movies you guys did, you know, it, it were movies that 
you know, weren't going to be a parody. You know, they were right. trying to make well, a serious any, film. Any self-consciousness um, would have disqualified us from, would have made us not do them. And, um, uh, the, the movies that we did on Mystery Science Theater and the Trace and I do, um, and the Mads are back are all very sincerely made movies. And, and that's why uh, uh, Trace and I really like doing movies from that era, from the 50s and 60s, because there's an earnestness to them. Mm -hmm. It makes them very conducive to riffing, you know, mm -hmm. whereas uh, any kind of um, irony or uh, winking at the audience on the part of the filmmakers, then, then it's it's then it's not good for riffing. They're they're already, um, you know, riffing on themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, so they don't need us really. You know, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think Sharknado needs a whole lot of help. <laughs> no, and you know what? It, it it they 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 figured out this audience for that kind of thing and they ran with it. They made like seven films or whatever, and mm -hmm. they had a big success with it, but it's, it's just not, and people automatic, some people automatically assume that I would be really be into Sharknado and that I would really want to riff it. And it's like the opposite of that. I have, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to riff it. And I, I'm not, um, it's not something I'm enthusiastic about. Although if people enjoy it, then, then that's great. By chance, have you seen a comedy of terrors? The Vincent Price yeah. movie? Uh, yeah, years and years ago, but um, uh, but not not recently. Like okay. basically, when I was a kid, I saw it. Yeah, because that just when you're talking about that made me think of that. Just where it's it very much is not oh, I think aware of itself, but it, it's very fun at the same time. So it feels yeah, like yeah. in that vein. It is that, and those um, those Edgar Allan Poe movies that. Roger Corman made with mm -hmm. Vincent Price are among are among Corman's best films oh, for yeah. sure. For sure, no doubt. So mentioning the the newer Manos flicks, um, Jackie Naaman Jones, who you have of course played Debbie in the original, and that you're going to have as your special guest for Q and A on the live riff. How did uh, all of that come about in getting her involved? Well, she just um, um, I think we just had some fans and some friends who alerted us to her and she she actually wrote a book about the movie and um uh and she was aware of us for sure and she was very uh um she was very grateful to us for for making the film famous and um, she's a very delightful person and um and we were just like kind of hooked up with her through mutual friends and um we had her she lives in Portland and we, when Trace and I did a show in Portland, like years ago, she was uh, there and, um, and we had, we had, uh, we weren't riffing Manos, but she was there in the audience and we had her come up and do a Q and A and stuff. And, uh, you know, so she's, so, so she's great. And of course, you know, we always have a Q and A guest for our live streams. And, and of course, Jackie was the perfect guest for this episode. Oh, for sure. Oh, That's absolutely. Helpful. I didn't know about her getting to come up on and do that Q&A. Was that like a surprise thing that she was doing that or did that, was that already like pre-planned? What, in Portland? Yeah. Um, I, no, it, it was, I think we knew she was going to be there. And um, so, uh, so it was just a kind of spontaneous thing. Although I think Trace already, and I knew that, that since she was going to be there, you know, we always did a Q&A at the end of the show. So we were going to bring her up. But in this case, my memory is that we had technical problems with the film we were showing and we had to really vamp, um, you know, for a long time before we even showed the movie. And I think we had her come up during that segment as well. Got yeah. it. Nice, nice. That had to be fun though. <laughs> yeah, so it was lucky, lucky she was there. Mm -hmm. For sure. Now we've been really enjoying the, the Mads monthly live streams. We've watched most of them. Okay. They're, uh, they're such a good time. And, um, you know, was that, I know you guys were touring, you and Trace beforehand, and then pandemic happened, unfortunately. Was it, was it difficult to transition from, from doing live shows to streaming shows? Because it feels like it would be quite the transition. Um, it was a transition for sure, but it was, 
it was kind of scary before we did it because it it, it was for us it was new territory um uh trace and i are both neither of us are particularly like tech savvy people trace is more tech savvy than i am but neither of us are really um uh you know that that, that kind of stuff doesn't come naturally to us and um I think it was lucky that I was friends with Chris Gershbeck. So I, I, I just sent him an email when, like one day, Trace and I were just, you know, what are we going to do? We, we can't perform live. This is our livelihood, you know, it's our income. And, um, you know, I just said, well, do you think we could maybe do live uh, streaming shows online? And he was like, gee, I don't know. Like we really didn't even know if we could pull it off. You know, it seemed like a very like, big thing to pull off to us, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and I wrote Chris Gershbeck an email and I said, but what, what do you think of this? Do you think this is possible? And he's like, Oh, let me look into it. And he did. And I think we, there were a couple of ways to go about it that weren't quite right. Um, and then we just, and then we just hit on zoom and YouTube and it, it just was easy. But before we did it, I was very scared. Like, and, and, you know, I was always like worried about technical problems and, and, you know, the whole thing having to, uh, having to be shut down because it's not working. And, you know, it, it was just very stressful. But once, once we did that first show and it went out off without a hitch, um, then we were like, wow, it was, it was like such a relief, you know, it's like, wow, this is this could actually work. And, and for for me, it's been such a blessing in the pandemic that that we were still able able to have income and mm. and and still make a living. I mean, so and it, and it really has transformed things in the sense that um, I would love to go back to doing live shows and I hope we do live shows. Um, maybe it'll happen next year. I'm not, I don't, I can't say for sure, but I hope we do. But, but even if we do, like, we're still going to always do the, the monthly streaming shows now. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. I'll say that's good because we really enjoy them. <laughs> yeah. It's like a special thing we look forward to every month. Yeah, so a it's... lot of audience, a lot of people, when we were doing the live shows, would be like, well, why don't you come to my town? I can't, I can't go and see that. That's like so far away. Although we did have people who drove long distances to come see us, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, so now it like, it kind of gives everybody a chance to see, to see the show, you know? Um, so, so it's, it's, it's been a total blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been one of the good things I think that came out of the pandemic is like, even like some of the bands we don't get to see very often that play in Europe, they all did live streams and stuff like that to make some side income. And we got to go basically watch bands that we, rarely ever get to see so yeah yeah i mean it's um i think the technology of it is you know not just for us but just for people doing uh, shows on zoom and stuff you know it's 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 such a great um it's given people just in their own homes you know a way to to be creative and, mm -hmm. and that's a really great thing for sure yeah it's a great medium for sure and it's like you guys i feel like are one of the pioneers really well, one of the first ones who really started doing it and doing yeah. it consistently well, we, were luck so. we were lucky in that we had something we could do riffing on movies that a lot of people already liked and that would even pay money if we charged them a little bit of money to watch it you know i think that's the puzzle a lot of people doing online stuff are trying to figure out is how to how to make income off of it. You know, mm -hmm. it's a very tricky thing. And we're we're we were lucky that we had this thing that lends it that lends itself well to to a streaming show in a way that maybe stand up comedy doesn't lend itself that mm -hmm. well because you're not in front of an if you're not in front of an audience, um, it's uh, it's you know it's awkward. At least I think I know a lot of my friends have been, we're doing online standup shows uh, during the pandemic, but I, I, but, but that's not the kind of thing I think is ever going to really catch on. Although, although I think more, I'm noticing that 
from a lot of live shows, a lot of music shows and comedy shows that there's a streaming option for them now more than there ever was before. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. I know the, uh, the Mads are no stranger to riffing shorts too. Um, you know, some right. of the shorts that you guys have done have been some of my absolute favorites, like how to keep a job just puts me in stitches every single uh, time. <laughs> Is it difficult to find new shorts to riff or are there just that no, many uh, no, educational they, films? They seem to, um, they seem to be available and, um, you know, the same thing with the movies that we do you know, you might have thought that we would have gone, gone through everything in Mystery Science Theater that was available. And, um, and then we find these films, you know, like, um, uh, you know, the one we did just last month, the um, Voyage to the Planet of Prehistoric Women. And I'm like, that was wonderful. Yeah, Absolutely like wonderful. How, how did we, how did we miss that one the first time around? You know? <laughs> so there's a lot of films like that. And there's a lot of shorts, um, out there like that so hopefully i think it'll be a while before we go through all of them yeah it's impressive to me how many of these kind of little educational films there are out there because yeah they, yeah that was a whole industry in its day you know a lot I of it out of watching kansas, some of those in school like i remember of, one of a lot of it out of kansas city i believe you know uh, centron and those uh, companies um that made those short films. It's it's a whole subgenre of filmmaking. Mm -hmm, for sure. I remember yeah. one in elementary school where it was this whole like, don't put your head under a bus, basically, and it had like a kid <laughs> reaching for a ball, and then the ball pops. And it's like that could have been your head. And it's like this is why I probably was traumatized. Like this is why kids in my generation have anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so um. I know that you've riffed so many things. If there's ever run into a movie or a short that's just like, this is just too rough that I can't do this. Well, yeah, we always had those, but, but the thing about those is they never make it past the stage of just screening it. And then you go, now nah, this, this, this I don't think really works either because it's too bad or it's too incompetently made. You can't hear anything. You can't see anything, you know, um, so, um, so, but, but, you know, people ask this, this a lot, if they ever started writing a film and then gave up in the middle of it. And that's, that's never happened. Once we commit to writing the film, then, then it'll, and then it gets done one way or the other. Out of okay. curiosity, going back to Manos, if they ever were to do like an actual remake of Manos, do you know who you think would want you or who you would want to play Torgo? Um, I think um, uh, uh, Zach Galifianakis, I think, would be like a. Oh, that'd be, that I didn't even. That would be great. Would be perfect. <laughs> um, and and I've I've known I've known uh, Zach for years. I used to do stand up with him in L.A. And um, it's funny because before he became really famous, um, uh. We, when we were doing Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, um, there was a riff where this guy that looked like, kind of looked like Zach Galifianakis came into the room and, and we just said, hey, Zach Galifianakis. And the audience, the audience went crazy. And I told Zach about that. I said, I said they, they freaked out when we did that. They loved it. And, and like, I didn't even know that that many people knew who you were, but they, <laughs> but they did, so. He would be, he would be uh, great as Torgo, and he's a really funny guy himself. So mm -hmm. that's what he would come up with um, uh, for that role, you know. But um, other than that, I mean, I don't know. Just Nick Cage, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I could see Nick Cage as the master. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. <laughs> All right, we got to make this happen now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I know one of the most infamous images for Manos is the cloak that the master wears, of course. And the MST3K episode, it was not hands, but feet. Who came up with that idea? Oh, I don't remember who came up with the... It's hard to remember who came up with what riff or mm -hmm. what idea for what sketch. So uh, someone came up with it. And we all encouraged whoever that person was. <laughs> uh -oh. That was perfect. For sure. I do, do you I think... 
I see people doing wearing that costume for Halloween and stuff, and so it's awesome. I heard the director like really embraced it and would wear that to like every Halloween party he went to, and like now his son does the same thing apparently. Yeah, I, I believe it. I totally believe it. Do you guys Will have it be making own... an appearance? In yes, the show? either you guys have <laughs> that room? <laughs> not, not so far that I know of. <laughs> That'd be funny if like one of you had the hands and one had the feet. Oh my goodness. Uh, but, yeah, we could do you could do they could someone needs to make one for Chris's cats and have paws on it instead. Oh sure. <laughs> this is I think you're coming up with a whole product line here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Cat Catos, the paws of fate. Yeah, Catos. Right. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Frank, for taking out uh, you know some part of your day to to talk to us today. You know, it's truly an honor. Um, you know, we we're looking forward to the riff on the fourteenth. It's going to be incredible. So everyone, remember December fourteenth, Manos, the hands of fate, with the Mads. Tickets are on Eventbrite. Be sure to check out the Mads website, madsareback.com, uh, Facebook. Uh, back for dot com forward slash the mads are back and at the mads are back on Twitter. Um, Frank, anything else you would like to add to this or? Um, just uh, uh, thank you. Just thank you so much for having me on the show. And um, and I hope people keep watching us and, uh, and I hope everybody stays safe. Absolutely. And we'll link everything <laughs> in the show notes. And again, Frank, thank you so much. It's been such an thank honor. Thank you. I, yep. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll we'll be watching on the fourteenth. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Have a happy holiday. You too. Thank you. You too, sir. See ya. Bye. Bye. -bye.